history is here to help. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And, and that's a yeah, handsome young man is Peter Hoffenberg. We're oh. all here to help. <laughs> handsome. <laughs> handsome is usually not an adjective. Thank you. Uh, obviously, your glasses need cleaning. But thank you very much. It's, all, it's always good to be here to chat. And we're going to talk about climate change and other disasters mm -hmm. and how they affect history. This is really important because we have so many things now Absolutely. that are either disasters or potential disasters, including bad storms, floods, droughts, famine, what have you. Um, and all these things affect the, the, the line of history. Uh, so, so, Peter, I mean, you're an historian at UH. You've been spending your life on history. You must have sort of a general thought about this and that you if you connect the dots from history to history from you know point of inflection to point of inflection a lot of those points of inflection will be disasters you know i'm thinking of i'm thinking of the black plague in the, in the 14th century that changed everything and that was one of the kind of disasters the inflection points that we need to appreciate if we're going to appreciate you know, European history, uh, Absolutely. Right? And I would say world history as well. You're abs absolutely right. Um, it's something I do actually lecture on and, and study. So I'm more than happy to discuss it with you, to field any questions. Uh, just as an introductory way uh, with my students, we look at something like the pandemic or a natural, which is somewhat natural, natural and has social implications. And I ask them to think about a, a couple of issues that catastrophes raise and also how we think about catastrophes in history. So I'm more than happy you can shoot the questions at me or I can introduce the way I discuss with students, whatever's best for you. Yeah, well, I want to you know, let you know in advance that some of these questions are really hard. I hope they really are. Really unfair questions. You know? I, I, those are the only ones I enjoy. <laughs> me too. When, when I'm asking someone else. Of course, of course. Anyhow, let's take, yeah, let's take go ahead a, with the questions and I'll major, be able to. A major sure. thing, okay? Um, a major thing like climate change. Uh, and, and it's biblical in the sense that, you know, humanity is being tested and humanity is failing the test as we watch. I mean, we can see Florida, for example, all the sad stories and all the houses broken and people losing their you know, property and their, their pet dog, whatever it is. And their lives. Um, their lives. Deaths as well, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a horrible uh, change in circumstances, all negative, okay? And, and when you multiply that by virtually millions, okay, you, 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 you must conclude as an historian or as a sociologist that, um, that there's an inflection point there. There's a, a dot to connect and it's, it's leading downward. But here's my question. Can you, can you play it out for me? Can you tell me how that expression of climate change and other expressions of climate change, and there are many more, uh, it's just a, you know, wildfires, floods, droughts, lack of food, extinctions of animals and plants, <laughs> starvation of populations, uh, resulting violence, famines, disease, of course, all that. It all comes from climate change. Uh, and my unfair question to you, I, how does this affect history? When you knit all these things together and you make a kind of, um, you know, a progress chart, mm -hmm. uh, what is the process and where does it take us? Okay, that is a tough question and it'll take a, a couple of weeks, but let me try to give some helpful answers, I hope, and then we can continue. Uh, we look at a crisis like this as a historian, so I'm not an environmental scientist, I'm not a food scientist, but if I, when I and my students look at a crisis like climate change, and the catastrophic ways in which climate change has unfolded, uh, we can ask some of the same questions. We're not, we're not sure if this is the end of all ends, if it is actually apocalyptic, but we can ask, ask questions which we ask of the other catastrophes that you mentioned. So for example, uh, does a catastrophe not only create new problems, but reveal some of the existing structural problems and I think the answer is yes, right? So we can see that again, catastrophes disproportionately hurt poor and vulnerable people who are poor and vulnerable in society. So some uh, scholars, uh, there's an, including a philosopher, argues that a catastrophe, uh, as uh, Ranka said, 
is a darkness that allows us to see. So a catastrophe, if society takes advantage of it, right? Catastrophes actually expose existing problems. And even though you're too young to remember this, uh, the Great Depression is a good example of this, where the Great Depression, some argued, right, needed a few tweaks here and there, and others argued and exposed the rot of capitalism. So that's one historical point of view that we can say, and the pandemic is that case, right? Pandemic again hit people most vulnerable who were already, right, most vulnerable. So that, that'd be one response where it's headed. Uh, secondly, is that uh, as a historian, we always look at language. How do people describe things? And your biblical reference is very helpful because <laughs> in the West, we often think in apocalyptic terms. But in apocalyptic terms, for example, in Christianity, right, the end of days will then create the afterlife and perfection. So we always have to wrestle a little bit, right, with the religious understanding. Uh, is this the, you know, book of Acts and then the time of the return of the Messiah? And certainly some people argue, right, catastrophes are signs that were headed towards a kind of perfection. Well, let me let me uh, stop you there and just sure. reflect on the points you just made and in reverse order. Mm -hmm. The thing about the ap apocalyptic analysis, it, I think it's a lazy way out. It's a lazy way out. It's not making the analysis we need mm -hmm. to make about where all these dots and threads are going. Um, we have to be smarter than that. And if you're a planner, call call you an historic planner, plan a planner who who evaluates and plans history. You can't just say it's an apocalypse. You can't do that. You have to you have to get real. You have to tell us where these threads are taking us and how life is going to be different for the survivors because not everybody survives a disaster. Um, and I think that's that's one element I would throw into the pot. The other element I would say, you know, when you talk about to use Trump's term, uh, draining the swamp, you know, when when you have a disaster and you remove, um, you know, things that maybe weren't clear, and now you see, lo and behold, all around you other issues that are problematic. What it does is it teaches you, it teaches you, you cannot see the world. In, in, in these simple terms. If I ask you my, my, my question a little while ago, you know, how is climate change um, affecting you know, the future of humanity or history? Um, that, that is really a trick question. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't announce it as a trick question. I understood it to be a trick question. Yeah. <laughs> because because it, it, all these threads are all connected. And, and the real challenge is to look at um, the other threads that are revealed by climate change and related disasters and connect those other threads too, because they're, you know, they all work together. I, I shouldn't say all, not all. And that's also a challenge to find the out essential, which ones. The essential ones do work together. Essential ones, but some don't. Sure. And so you have to make a, a choice about which is essential and, and which is not. <clears throat> and so history is a combination of threads very complicated. And if you did a Microsoft chart on it, you know, it would be as big as all humanity, that chart, because there are so many factors and things that are under the under the surface, you know, after you drain the swamp, so to speak, um, that, you know, it would take you a lifetime just to figure out the connections. I don't know if historians do that. Um, do they do that? And should they do that? Well, historians, as, as far as we'll say catastrophes in the past, not, we're, we're a little wary of suggesting where this could go. I, I really trust the environmental scientists much more than myself. But to answer your question, yes, scholars do. And there's some very helpful books. Uh, Simon Winchester has a book about Krakatoa. And the explosion of Krakatoa is, a, I think, a good, healthy example of what you're talking about, how uh, Krakatoa uh, affected uh, really much of the world, uh, including it probably, uh, provoked uh, jihadist rebellions as far away as the Sudan. So that was a good example of how uh, in the 19th century Krakatoa, uh, El Nino, there's a book uh, by Mike Davis, uh, an author uh, who lives on the Big Island and a journalist who traces uh, El Nino as a climate catastrophe. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, most historians try to do that. The difficulty we have is uh, some of us are wary, right, of venturing into areas 
we don't really know very much about. So you look at the Black Death, you really have to, you have to st start with the medical history, right? You have to understand how it was brought, how it affected people. Um, so historians are interested in its impact on the labor market and food, but we often have to call upon our, our medical or health scholars, like Robert Litton, who teaches here, is an expert on the plague in Athens. Mm. That required him to do some medical research. So I think the answer is it's done. Um, it's done best, though, when a historian says, I don't know everything. Let me call upon some of the experts. Okay, but you know, if, if I walked around uh, UH Manoa, I would find a lot of a lot of the academics uh, say, I'm into multidisciplinary studies. I, I gather data on a multitude of disciplines and issues uh, across the board. And although I may be in one school, you know, focusing on this subject or that, this science or that, um, I also, um, you know, I, I, I wrap around other schools fault, uh, focusing maybe not so, not so scientific as sociology, what have you, mm -hmm. or history. And, and I'm thinking the future of, of academia must include a multidisciplinary person who is, yes, a, a historian, but also a scientist. And it does. Who, who will not say, I'm sorry, I can't talk about that because that's for somebody else. He will say, I can talk about that because I wrap around all of these things and I'm willing to give you, you know, the comprehensive. That is being done. Uh, right now, there's a whole school of study on what's called the Anthropocene, right? The, the uh, geological uh, era of humanity, basically. And the Anthropocene, excuse me, uh, is really a study of climate change. And that includes political scientists, environmental scientists, historians, etc. I'm not sure if there's an individual I could point to, but certainly the, the scholarship is there. The difficulty, as you know, is the public perception of that scholarship. I mean, we still have a political debate. In the face of these crises, we still have a political debate about whether or not uh, there is something called uh, climate change, which humanity is affecting, or folks who argue that this kind of climate change we've seen before, so we've seen extinctions. This so is a lot of magical, non-scientific thought going out there. But scholars are doing what you what you mentioned. I don't. I can't tell you a single person, but there are study groups, and even here on campus, we have people studying the Anthropocene who talk to each other. Uh, so I think the work is it's being done. We're, historians are a little wary about. We have enough trouble with the past. We're a little wary of projecting the future. But don't, don't but we certainly need, ultimately need that in order to examine the, the, the very larger issues. I would like to see an article or a book about where exactly is climate change taking us? Um, because it doesn't, you know, it, you can't have the, you know, the disaster scenario, when I mean disaster, I mean the, the apocalypse scenario um, without examining how the different threads are connected. By the way, I want to go back to your reference to Krakatoa. In my notes here, I actually included Krakatoa, mm -hmm. and I included Vesuvius too, mm -hmm. as a, you know, as a as a big disaster. But let's take Krakatoa, and let's take uh, the jihad that you mentioned. Um, how have historians connected up Krakatoa, this big eruption, big, big, big eruption, what, uh, 200 years ago maybe, um, and um, and and jihad? How, how can you make that connection? This is a really good case study. So the, the thesis is that uh, Krakatoa, first of all, was not a local event. So we have to understand that like, Vesuvius was primarily a local event. Uh, Krakatoa, uh, like a storm um, and crisis in the early 18th century, uh, affected much of the globe. So the argument is that as it affected much of the globe, as we're seeing today, it did at least two things. One, if you had a kind of apocalyptic vision of the world, which is not reserved for Christianity, it was a sign of some divine intervention. And disasters have always, at least with some people, been seen as the hand of God, whatever their God is. And secondly, it had real on the ground impact, particularly as far as food, uh, the ability of colonial officers to control colonial societies. So the argument is essentially that the uh, biology and the climatology affected harvests, uh, directly affected social relations, 
And one of the responses, this historian argues, is jihadism, in particularly the Horn of Africa, the rise of the Mahdi, and some of the some of the jihadists that some of the current jihadists refer back to. So they don't all go back to the caliphs or Muhammad. Some of them refer to late 19th, early 20th century, um, where there's a significant amount of jihadism in North Africa and in the Sudan. So that's just one example, right? Clouds filled with uh, food killing chemicals travel, not just of course Indonesia, which was devastating, but travel around the world. So the argument you know, for today would be um, the impact of heat, right? The warming of the earth doesn't just affect Norway, it affects Pakistan, it affects California. In most particularly, and I don't mean this in a banal way because it's the most essential, right? It affects food production. And you add climate change, the war in Ukraine, and you really, you do have a significant food crisis right now, both man and nature made, well, man-made through climate, but directly man-made through war. So- That's so interesting. You talk yeah. about war, um, you know, so you're not only talking about um, people who don't have enough food, you're not only talking about starving or the disease that comes from not having mm -hmm. enough food. So those are actual, factual things that follow on our little chart. Um, but you're also talking about psychology and sociology, uh, which when you throw it in the mix and you start um, making your analysis on the basis of how these things or the threat of these things affect our state of mind. And I say our state of mind, I mean, 7 billion, 8 billion states of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and that affects history by itself. Even if you subtract the, the reality of, of, um, of lack of food or disease, if people are afraid of these things, if they're afraid of continuing their lives in a straight line and they, and they redirect their lives in fear of something, um, that, that affects history too. And, and that's very, very, very subjective. Uh, absolutely, I mean, two, two points which you know, but just to remind you, and we're dealing with that with climate migration now, even if it's not directly affecting people, they fear. I mean, the, island, the atolls will disappear in the Pacific. The sense is that those would inevitably disappear. You're absolutely right. In part, and secondly, to help address your question, we add another field to our study, which is psychology. And the Freudian and, and neo Freudian analysis of trauma helps us understand this as well. Not just the trauma itself, but the fear of trauma and how one responds to that, uh, how one responds to uh, a, a fear of catastrophe to take preventive measures or sometimes acceptance, right? Sometimes the reverse of resiliency is an acceptance of what's going to happen. And we see that, I think, also kind of inertia. Um, either it's inevitable or it'll happen down the road. Um, and again, the Great Depression is a really good example because, as you know, among the consequences of the Great Depression uh, are insurance policies for our banking accounts, right? So. The idea was, right, that the Great Depression was caused by this mania on money, uh, people losing money, people grabbing money. So we go from the exp explanation of the trauma directly to a solution, at least at that time. So if climate change is caused by coal burning, right, we should do something about coal burning. All right, that's the kind of question, though, that depends upon how you define and explain what's actually happening. Right? If you're willing to say, yes, it's coal, then rationally you should address coal. But you can see that also rationally, if you don't think it's coal, then you're not going to address coal. So the cause of the catastrophe is crucial. Right? I mean, by ensuring banking, uh, we're following more of a kind of Milton Friedman-esque view that the banks were the problem in the Great Depression, not capitalism itself, right? As other people said. Oh. So if but you but the, you you build in the notion of irrationality. So um, the the, the Archduke of Serbia is shot, and as a result, we have a world war. Uh, what's rational about that? Um, and so, uh, just as a rational fear of a disaster or something really negative that might that might hurt us uh, can create a change in history, so can an irrational 
uh, analysis oh, and your absolutely. actual reaction. I, I, and, and there's no way to anticipate that. No, there's no way to anticipate it, but it's where um, you know, economists working on theories of expectation and psychologists working on trauma and fear, as you, as you ask for a multidisciplinary, we bring those in as well. Uh, but again, yes, I mean, you're, you're also faced with an, another field that's growing, which is this field of contagion studies. And uh, Facebook is a good example, right? A kind of a contagion that spreads. And a recent study I read last week, it spread in ways that people actually believe things that they know are wrong. They will believe those and they'll act on those. We're so, getting really good at that. Yeah, I mean, we're venturing into an, era, uh, an area where um, neuroscience probably would help, which is well beyond my pay, pay scale. But how, I mean, let's be honest, I mean, how the brain actually works. <laughs> Uh, and we, we have made incredible advances, but we haven't yet figured out <laughs> uh, the power of that irrational component <laughs> in the brain to seemingly, right? I mean, the brain, I guess, I mean, the brain tells us that our irrationality is rational. I mean, it's a Freudian problem, right? It's the rationalization of the irrational. So you and I think it's irrational and our brains think it's irrational. But of course, if you ask somebody else, very importantly, right? It is within their worldview. It makes sense to them. Uh, so, and climate change, I think, what you start with is a great example. Why some people either won't believe it's happening or think we can't do anything about it or see me, seeing the potential end, don't think the sacrifices are worth it. And I think you've seen in the United States, it takes bold measures like California You know, in 20 years will not have internal combustion cars. That's the answer. No, that's kind, kind, of an, that's kind of an FDR. I mean, it's an FDR, you know, bank holiday answer. That look, uh, this is a crucial problem. Uh, a democratically elected leader, democratically elected leader, right? Representing the majority of the people says that, look, this, this is a problem which government has to intervene. And I think you'll, you'll probably see the country split between, right, blue states that'll do something like that and red states. I mean, the senators in Florida who are happy to criticize helping New Jersey, but want money to come to Florida. I don't, I don't see major changes, you know, in, in the government in Florida, which is absolutely necessary. Two thoughts. One is it seems to me that if we put a, a human knowledge into AI, which is still in its <laughs> infancy, we could probably figure out the probabilities and maybe even get good probabilities on what's going to happen, even though it's irrational. Oh, I think we already know. I, I mean, yeah. the, the, mo the models already, the, the solid models already tell us where we're going. Yeah. I don't think there's any doubt. You see that in the angst of the younger generation, which is much more attuned to it than we are. Uh, I mean, I think that helps explain. I mean, that plus the pandemic, boom. I mean, you took a generation and as NPR said the other day, you know, they interviewed somebody. I mean, why bother working? <laughs> you know, why, why, why bother doing much when literally, for some, the world, the world is ending. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, well, for some I, people, I agree. And, and that may not be, but that may not be irrational. The, the rational kick has to come in that we still have to have uh, faith that we can apply our knowledge to address the problem. But look, in our society, we even disagree about experts and knowledge, right? We can't even, we can't have a national consensus that a scientist is correct on this. We can't well, even have that. But we have to get rational, and we do have the technology to be rational. And uh, there could be a little black box, uh, six inches by six inches, on, on top of a mountain in somewhere in the Rockies uh, that could make policy decisions for us. Well, so ironically, we ironically, within the government, the, the one body which is doing something about this is actually the military. The military is planning for climate change. Mm. I, don't, I don't like, uh, you know me in militarism, but if we look at some at an institution that's actually thinking ahead, it's the Pentagon. And if you look at the Pentagon budget and their weaponry, which is nothing I'm celebrating, but just talking about a rational actor, uh, they know their goal, right, is to win a war. And they know that the climate change is going to affect 
how wars are fought. So they're ahead, you know, they're thinking ahead, ironically. Uh, ironically, because they can yeah. also be wrong. And, but they can be and, wrong and, and they can also a disastrous fought. result. Oh, uh, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not holding it up. <laughs> I'm holding it up, uh, not the Pentagon being a good guy, but I'm holding it up that it is possible for a government institution. And if it's possible for the government, it's also possible for the private sector to do the models you suggested, assume the goals are still the same, assume and see what changes we need to make in light of rising waters, uh, you and I both know that uh, starvation is going to force migration, which is going to force conflicts. I mean, part of the Syrian civil war is based on food prices, part of it. I mean, Sri Lanka has no fuel. I mean, these are all connected. They're not just economic issues. Uh, they're economic reflections. But also there's a, a yin and yang because the economics then also push the climate change, right? There's a yin and a yang. I mean, economics, climate change, climate change economics, uh, it's a little chicken in the egg. Okay, so would you, would you agree with me that disasters, whether they're fast or slow, uh, have the greatest effect on history? Have the greatest effects? Well, that is a hard question. The greatest effect. Can we say they have had significant effect that we cannot think or write about history without epic catastrophes. Is that an acceptable answer? Well, uh, if, I, if I have a, a Krakatoa or some kind of really huge disaster, a climate change disaster, a right. pandemic disaster, that is really going to change the direction of the dots. Um, it does. More, more than just getting up in the morning and uh, going to work. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the difficulty for professional historians like myself is the, the foundation of that argument is uh, things changed and things changed in a way which they would not have if the disaster had not occurred, right? That's exactly. kind of a logic. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. historians, while recognizing that, are a little wary because we're not sure whether or not, for example, those consequences would have happened anyhow. So there would have been jihadism. Now, the historian responds to your question by saying catastrophes, extremely important, historical connections important. They affect uh, how perhaps something occurred. So they may explain, for example, why jihadism occurred exactly at that moment in exactly that place, right? But that's different than saying, well, the Mahdi would not have risen without Krakatoa. Does that make sense? I mean, you're a lawyer, so you can see- Oh, the, no, well, one factor right. among many factors, and if we sat here and and read a, a lot of books, we would figure out what other factors were in play for the jihad right, and, movement. But also whether jihad would have occurred, you know, without, with the absence of Krakatoa, sure. Yeah, Krakatoa. So I think the affirmative answer is yes, absolutely. And more and more historians are writing in light of catastrophe and trauma and recovery, more and more. And so if you look at more, more titles, more sources, bibliographies, et cetera, Absolutely right. They completely agree with you. Uh, there's always been a big cottage industry about the plague and the Black Death. That's always been, that's built in. Um, I think more and more, even Timothy Snyder uh, wrote a, one of his books about uh, Hitler and the Holocaust, and really in a climate change argument. He argued basically Laban's wrong, <laughs> but it was in response. Well, Laban's wrong, sure. Right, right. <laughs> and so Tim Snyder is taking a traditional topic, right, Nazis and the Shoah, and he's giving it also an interpretation. So, so I think people are right on board with what you're saying. We're just not, uh, we're a little wary of, you know, the old Latin phrase, if it follows, I don't remember it. It's in, it's in law as well. You know, if something happened, if A and B happen, that doesn't mean that A caused B, right? right. It's a Latin phrase, okay? Right, right, it's right. in the West Wing. So historians are always a little wary. We say, yes, Krakatoa, yes, Jihad. Um, more than contingent, the, but the historians who are most troubled by this are generally historians who have, and again, I don't say this in a pejorative way, they have kind of a grand view, right? So uh, Marxist historians have a particularly grand view, and Krakatoa, you know, is secondary to class struggle. Uh, mm -hmm. Other people have a view that the nation will always rise. So sure, Krakatoa affected nationalism. So some of it depends upon what kind of history 
uh, if you want to have a, a, a lesson in history or one common story, then you're probably a little more reluctant to look at well, this. Well, we, we, care, we care about negative events because they lead to other negative events. I'm, I'm being uh, kind of a, an armchair historian here. Sure, sure. Um, so if I have a disaster, um, I, can, I can make the assumption that uh, starvation in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa is going to result in people uh, trying to get to a better place and maybe mm -hmm. crossing over the Mediterranean into Europe. And, and that leads to um, a resistance, political resistance in Europe. All these things are connected. Um, and so if you take one bad event, one natural disaster, um, then, you know, you can say, well, there's a fair chance this is going to result in, in war, in violence, in contention, in attempts to take territory, whatever it is, and killing other people okay? and who don't die by the disaster themselves. And so the question is, if I have my little black box on the top of the Colorado uh, a divide over there, okay. <laughs> um, examine all these things with this really powerful AI, and I try to identify how the disaster event leads to the war event, um, would there be, you know, would there be a connection there? Uh, and could I figure out how to, to ameliorate the disaster event, listen to this one, so as to avoid the war. I think it is a wonderful idea <laughs> and something that some of us do think about historically. Uh, and it gets back to, again, you as a lawyer, right? It gets back to what's, what's the prime cause. So today our discussion prime cause is climate change. Absolutely, right? Uh, control climate change, build properly. Don't build in areas which are vulnerable. Uh, provide food support, all of those I think we can agree on. Uh, what gets into play, of course, is also uh, national integrity, uh, political stability within a country. I mean, I think Syria is a really interesting case for us to think about. We spend a lot of time on Ukraine, but that's because we've ignored Syria. And Syria is a pretty good example of what you're talking about. Everything combined, food crisis, tyranny, lack of democracy, forced immigration, immigration of people of color who are not accepted, <laughs> immigration of Christians who are not accepted. I think, that's, I think it's apropos exactly of what you're talking about. Uh, the one additional point would be it's a civil war. So Syria is not interested in expanding, but Russia used Syria as a testing ground. What the Russians have tried to do in Ukraine, almost all that they practiced in, in Syria before. So I think you're ab absolutely right if we have that AI um, and again, this is nothing profound. We're really, we're talking about food. I mean, the bottom line is we're talking about food. Food prices, uh, the quality of food, the accessibility of food. And I'm more than happy to come back and talk about famine, which is something I work on. Uh, I'll just give you one comment from Sen, former Nobel laureate. He says, uh, a famine is not uh, not enough food. A famine is not getting food to the people who need it. It's a very different issue. Mm -hmm. And so what he claims is famines are not possible in true democracies. I'll leave you with that. Oh, I'm happy, oh, yeah. I'm happy to pick up. I'm happy to pick up on that. We so already need to cover that, but before yeah. you go. But that gets back to a place like Syria or the Sudan, where it's probably true that it, climate uh, has affected the amount of the harvest. That's clearly true, and salinization, clearly. Um, but the other element is that the food that is there is, again, not, going, not getting to the poorest people, not getting to people who live. It's going to the cities. Uh, before Sudan split, uh, Islam, Islamic Sudan in the north did not provide food for the, for the animists in the south. So there are lots of different ways to keep, and, and uh, Assad would not provide any food to Aleppo or places like that. Another kind of slavery. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me go to uh, one other thing, which has been in the paper. Last question, really. So we have had this uh, really incredible storm uh, through Florida, and it destroyed a lot of communities, uh, some more than others, but a lot of them totally destroyed. Oh, right. and there was an article in, in the Times uh, yesterday, I think, 
uh, it was a, a, an essay or an opinion piece. And the question it raised was, should we rebuild these communities or move and find other places that are safer and less vulnerable to climate change? And does history indicate, you know, our experience? I mean, this is, this is history is here to help, right? Does our, does our experience with history make this clear enough that we can't rebuild all these, you know, cities and towns that have been wiped out only to have them wiped out again? Uh, don't we learn from history? Isn't history here to help? I'm, Why I'm, don't we find another way? I'm um, laughing because I'm afraid in this case, history is not here to help. <laughs> and historically, <laughs> historically, people have continued to rebuild where places are most vulnerable. Uh, I highly recommend if people have a chance to read Mike Davis's book about LA and Malibu. Malibu is a good example, right? How many fires? How many floods, how many earthquakes can occur so people stop building in Malibu? So you raise a wonderful point. Uh, what I see happening, unfortunately, is unless people have the ability to move, which includes, as you say, the psychology, right? That I'm willing to move. I see one of two things happen. I see people who can't afford it building what are still vulnerable homes. And I read and heard yesterday about a community in Florida, which fully survived because it was planned ahead of time. But that caught, that costs money, right? Uh, the homes are on the average about 250,000, which really for a lot of Floridians is not, not possible. It required the use of engineering and science. So I know we're running out of, town, out of time, but for example, when there's a flood in the community, the water goes down the road and not into people's homes. There are ponds around the homes, so floodwaters. So I give you two possibilities from history. <laughs> One is we learn, and even if we build where we are, we build better. Okay, that's a possibility. Unfortunately, most of history suggests most people cannot move and most people rebuild. Uh, how many how many floods will New Orleans experience, right? And some people just can't move, though, not even for the psychological reasons. And that may be where uh, the president has said the federal government will help Florida, and helping Florida might mean helping people move. And there's some thought that people, some if they can, they will move, and that some of the northern cities better be prepared. They better be prepared for housing and mental health, et cetera. So I think you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, history can only help a little bit. <laughs> um, and, I do, and I do recommend if folks are interested, Mike Davis's work on Malibu, because it's kind of, it's a microcosm, uh, top 0.2% of the world microcosm. But it is essentially the same problem, right? I'm going to rebuild exactly where the fire caused by climate change destroyed my previous home. I'm not going to move a bit. Um, and I don't think that's reserved just for the wealthy. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. What of a great course, conversation. My pleasure. <laughs> All Peter right. Hoffenberg, a history professor at UH Manoa, uh, talking here about how history can help. And, and we touched on a number of things where it can help, or maybe not. And there's more that comes out of this discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. Of course. Aloha. Take Aloha. care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.